So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about hypertension and just cherry pick a few topics um, that are hopefully of some interest. Um, I've, I declare I've got no interest in any of the drugs that I talk about, any of the fancy gizmos and technology um, for treatment of hypertension, regrettably. Um, <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to cover um, resistant hypertension, really, and talk a bit about um, the role, if any, of uh, renal vascular disease and treating that, some of the recent evidence for the uh, use or otherwise of renal denervation therapy, and um, uh, also talk about drugs that might be, or a drug in particular, that may be useful in resistant hypertension. So that's quite uh, one of the onuses on uh, resistant blood pressure. Um, I'll also cover at the end a very recent topical trial on trying to decide on what targets we should use in hypertension, the SPRINT trial. I'm sure you've all seen that. That's um, a very interesting trial that we can pick through. Um, and uh, first, though, I thought I'd just start with a few basics just to... Um, cover some initial ground um, and the first thing to say that is hypertension is really quite tricky. Um, the first thing that's really quite tricky about it is that it's um, difficult to make a, a diagnosis of what is a diagnosis of hypertension because we know that blood pressure is a, a normally distributed variable and as blood pressure goes up so does cardiovascular risk. And that starts at systolics of about 120. So as blood pressure goes up, so does your risk. So it's really arbitrary where you decide to put the line to the right of which patients are ill and have got a disease and they've got hypertension, to the left of which they're normal, they're fine. So clearly that's, that's paradoxical and that, that's not real. So it's really difficult to make that line of who has got hypertension. The corollary of that is that it's really difficult, therefore, to decide what a target should be, what, what blood pressure you should aim for, because we know that as we bring blood pressure down, your cardiovascular risk comes down. So why arbitrarily decide on a bring it down to a systolic of X? Why not X minus 5 or X minus 10? So it's really difficult to um, choose a target, and we'll talk about that. It's also really difficult to treat as well because we know that hypertension is an asymptomatic chronic condition. So trying to persuade patients to take medications for the rest of their life that's only going to make them feel worse is really quite tricky. So someone, I think, has been said in the past that a, de a good definition of uh, hypertension is the level of blood pressure above which treatment does more good than harm above which you get some net clinical benefit. And I actually think that's quite useful, and we can come back to that at the end, I guess. But of course, we have to give some sort of number, um, and so the numbers at the moment are hypertension is defined as greater than 140 over 90, and it's broken down into different stages of high blood pressure, and I, I'm not sure they're terribly useful in clinical practice. They're great when you're doing studies and audit and epidemiology, but I'm not sure that um, telling a patient they've got stage 2 rather than straight, stage 3 blood pressure is, much, is very useful. Um, there is this condition that the Americans have invented of pre-hypertension. We're, we're not advocating treating it yet, um, but, but clearly patients in that sort of uh, marker might uh, benefit from lifestyle changes. The reason that hypertension is important, of course, though, is that it's really common. So a billion people, this is World Health Organization data, and a billion people around the world would be classified as hypertensive with a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. And about 30 or 40 percent of patients, uh, of adults over the age of 25, would have, be classified as hypertensive. And that's irrespective of what continent you're on, so there's no geographical bias, uh, and it's irrespective of what uh, your socio-economic background as well. So it's a very common problem, hypertension. And we know that not only is it common, but it's the leading cause of cardiovascular uh, mortality. 
So there's 17 million cardiovascular deaths around the world every year, and the leading cause is hypertension. The good news is that we can do something about it. We know there's this log linear relationship between cardiovascular risk uh, and, um, and any blood pressure. So risk is on the y-axis here. You might not be able to see that. And uh, this is stroke on the left and uh, coronary disease on the right. But essentially, uh, for every uh, uh, 10 millimeters of uh, blood pressure that you lower, there's a, uh, a uniform reduction in risk. So that's great. So the, if we lower blood pressure, we can lower cardiovascular risk and improve outcomes. The, the bad news, though, from a lot of epidemiology is that we do it quite badly. So um, if patients are diagnosed with hypertension, and that's a whole other story, actually there's a lot of people walking around with high blood pressures that don't know it, but of, of the people that have been diagnosed with as hi having hypertension and commenced uh, on treatment, some studies have shown that um, they're only managed to target in about 50% of cases. And um, between, th depending on what trial you read and what epidemiology you read, between 13 and 30% of treated hypertensives have resistant hypertension. Why is that important? Well, resistant hypertension is a really valuable commodity and is really attractive to drug companies and device companies because it's, these are huge numbers of people with resistant hypertension uh, and so it's clearly a source of uh, uh, financial benefit to some of these companies. The diagnosis or the definition of resistant hypertension is having a, uh, a blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90 despite being adherent to three drugs, one of which must be uh, a, a, a diuretic. I think generally the cornerstone of uh, medical management of hypertension is the combination of a diuretic and an ACE inhibitor uh, and a vasodilator and we understand that about 30% of all patients with hypertension will need triple therapy to get to targets. But for resistant hypertensive patients that have ongoing hypertension despite medical therapy, what are the options? Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the intervention possibilities and spironolactone. So we'll start with uh, renal vascular disease. So what I'm going to talk about is um, bog standard commoner garden atherosclerosis. I'm not going to talk about anything fancy like fibromuscular dysplasia in very young people causing hypertension because there is some good evidence that treatment of that can bring down blood pressure. I'm talking about the vast majority, and I'm not talking about va uh, vasculitis either, I'm talking about the vast majority of patients who have renal artery stenosis secondary to atherosclerosis. And that's really common. Um, it is really common. Um, if you do a coronary angiogram in patients with coronary disease and you look at the renal arteries, about 30% of patients will also have concurrent renal artery stenosis. Um, um, we know that because um, atherosclerosis is a fairly ubiquitous disease, so once you've got it in one organ, it's going to be somewhere else. Uh, and overall, probably about 1 to 5% of patients with hypertension are going to have concurrent renovascular atherosclerotic disease. And up until recently, it was quite a, a money spinner because it, just in the US alone, 40,000 stents were put into the renal arteries of, of uh, each year. To what benefit? Let's, let's explore. So clearly with renal artery stenosis we want to ensure that there's a, a net benefit um, and weigh up the advantages against the disadvantages because there is a mortality and morbidity associated with um, uh, um, angioplasty to the uh, renal stenosis uh, and the aim would be to um, uh, lower blood pressure. So this is a, a, a meta-analysis back from 2006 looking at the state of play of uh, supporting evidence that would show that uh, um, examining the role of how advantageous um, stenting renal arteries was. Um, so this was 2006 
and they looked at all the studies that had been done up until then. And you can see there was lots of problems with the studies that had been done up until then. Um, there were just some just cohort studies that were observational follow-up studies. They weren't all placebo-controlled. Um, there was a lot of old studies, some studies dating back to the 1970s. Um, there weren't very many patients that had undergone renal artery uh, revascularization. So there was a real understanding that there was a lot of poor studies prior to 2006. And when they looked at all those studies and um, did the meta-analysis on hard uh, outcomes such as um, death, um, preservation of kidney function uh, and improvement of blood pressure, um, there was no real evidence that um, revascularization of renal arteries did any good. And this was their conclusion, um, that the evidence is not sufficiently robust to determine the effectiveness of angioplasty. So on the light of that uncertainty or that equipoise, there followed two big trials looking at um, uh, revascularizing renal artery stenosis. The first one was Astral, uh, published in 2009, and the primary outcome was looking at uh, improvements uh, in uh, renal function, uh, but nevertheless they also looked at blood pressure control as well. So in this group they enrolled 400 patients into each arm, and in one arm, they, um, the patient just underwent renal angioplasty and medical treatment versus medical treatment on its own. And they enrolled uh, a good number of patients um, that were fairly typical. They were mean age 70, there was diabetics, peripheral vascular disease, so reasonably, but they only followed them up for 27 months, which was one of the uh, deficiencies. But over that time, it was a, a negative study. There was no benefit that, that the stenting in the stenting arm offered no benefit in any outcome, including blood pressure control. So their conclusions was that renal artery revascularization is not superior to medical therapy alone. There was lots of problems with the astral trial. There was quite... Um, uh, they weren't very robust in the type of stenoses that they recruited. So these days we would suggest that more than 70% stenosis is significant, but they recruited people up to 40 or 50% stenosis and angioplasted them. Um, they took all different types of renal dysfunction. They didn't pol um, follow them up for very long, as I mentioned. And there were differences in the type of medication that was used for blood pressure control between the groups. So there was a lot of problems with Astral. So on the back of that, the, the, the Coral study uh, was published in 2014. And again, they uh, had two arms, angioplasty and medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. They looked at some hard endpoints, mortality for example, but included blood pressure control. Um, there was no, certainly no improvement in, this is event-free survival on the y-axis there, and there was certainly no difference in mortality um, between stenting and medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. And there was no difference in blood pressure control either. So both groups ended up on a mean number of three drugs and there was an identical um, blood pressure reduction uh, in each arm. So their conclusion was that there was no evidence uh, and no advantage for stenting on its own. So at the moment, the state of play is that there's no evidence for uh, stenting of renal artery stenosis uh, solely for for blood pressure control. There's certainly a role for it in other indications to prevent um, uh, ischemic nephropathy and flash uh, pulmonary edema and for those really rare cases of fibromuscular dysplasia but for the vast majority renal stenting has no role. What about this new trendy renal denervation? So there's lots of Devices that have been developed over the last few years. Renal denervation is uh, one of them. There are other 
fashionable, trendy devices where you can pace the Bero receptors, you can pace the vagus nerve, you can pace in a surrogate way your median nerve because that might talk to your vagus nerve in some sort of way that, that then sort of reduces sympathetic drive and reduces the uh, uh, effect of the vasomotor center and reduces blood pressure. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. And these are just some of the... Um, uh, pieces of kit um, that you can use. So on the left, so if you want to put someone through renal denervation, you clearly got to cannulate the femoral artery, you feed up your technology through to the um, uh, renal arteries on both sides, and then somehow you've got to destroy both the afferent and efferent uh, nerves in, that surround the media of the renal arteries. And you can destroy those nerves in a, a different number of ways. On the left, uh, there's the radio frequency uh, ablators. So you can put your ablation catheter in and then via radio frequency destroy those nerves. Um, e and F are uh, um, uh, thermal ways to heat the nerves and destroy them by temperature. Um, G and H are ultrasonic ways. Actually, G is, is via the renal artery. You put that in and via ultrasonic waves, you can destroy the renal artery nerves. H is one of these percutaneous ultrasound devices where you put the device on the outside and zap the nerves from the outside. I don't know how that works. Um, I is great. So I is another catheter that you put into the renal artery and then you press a button and lots of little needles come out and you, it stabs the inside of the vessel and then you infuse a, uh, a nerve blocker like guanethidine to destroy it, and then you retract the needles and bring it out again. Uh, J, K and L are these fancy um, baroreceptor uh, paces and I won't be talking about those. But there is some history to this. There is method in their madness. Because we know that in the 1930s and 40s, before any medical therapy was available, that um, uh, abdominal sympathectomies were done to treat blood pressure. And it was fantastic. It really lowered your blood pressure. So much so, you couldn't stand up. And so the postural hypotension was terrible. So clearly that fell out of uh, favour. Um, but the, the thinking was, if we could somehow destroy the sympathetic nerves a bit more locally, in the renal those ones in the renal artery walls, maybe that may lower blood pressure, but not cause the systemic effects of postural hypotension. And so that was the theory... The first one um, to use those radio frequency ablators was in 2009. That's the simplicity uh, trial. And that was just a very basic safety trial where they did it in about 45 people and they uh, ablated their renal nerves, did some office blood pressures at baseline and at six months, and it wasn't placebo controlled, and it showed dramatic benefits. This, uh, just concentrate on C maybe, but I mean, essentially this shows the blood pressure lowering uh, in those, that cohort of 45 people uh, over the first six months after they'd had their renal nerves zapped. Uh, and essentially, uh, systolic in blue, diastolic in red. At, at two years, the, those 45 patients had dropped by 27 over 17. And these were resistant hypertensive patients that were recruited. It was fantastic. And so this really snowballed um, since 2009. Over the next few years, it really snowballed, such that the European Society of Hypertension in 2012 was its, yes, we should be considering this, and it was written in their guidelines. Um, and up until that stage, um, the, the, in clinical practice, the number of times renal denervation was used took off as well. So by 2012, 4,000 people had been zapped. They had their renal artery nerves zapped, whereas only 500 had been recruited to trials. So it was really taking off in clinical practice on the basis of that one study. However... They started beefing up some of the numbers and importantly for this Simplicity 3 trial, what they did was they had a placebo group, so they had a sham operation group. So half of the patients underwent 
uh, renal denervation. The other half went down to the cath lab, had their femoral artery cannulated. Everyone stood around for half an hour and didn't do anything. And then they went back to the ward. Um, but at least it, it, it was a good placebo-controlled uh, trial. And the other advantage was that they did 24-hour um, uh, ambulatory blood pressure recordings at baseline uh, and throughout the study, rather than office uh, blood pressures, which can sometimes be open to bias. And using this much better trial design, it showed that renal denervation didn't work at all. It was no different to patients that had the sham procedure and were just on medical therapy. So, at the moment, um, renal denervation isn't being used in hypertension. There are some stalwarts that are really keen on it and think, well, well there are reasons why it didn't work. Um, it may be because although we catheterized the renal artery um, and zap the renal nerves, we didn't actually destroy all of, all of them. And, and that's true. There's, the poss the, we, there's no test to show whether you have destroyed all the renal nerves. So it may have been an, an incomplete procedure. There may be other, alternatively, there may be other demographics, demographics in, the, in patients that we can't yet measure that might allow us to define who might benefit from renal denervation. At the moment, it's all comers, and clearly that doesn't work. But there may be a way of trying to define who maybe is over -sympathetic, has over-sympathetic activity. We can't do that at the moment, but th th there may be developments in the future. But certainly it's not going to go away, this technique, because already at the moment it's being used in patients with heart failure, in trials, being used as a trial in heart failure, um, in kidney disease, and also in diabetics, because it's been found to reduce insulin resistance as well. So it's certainly um, going to be something that we see over the next few years, this procedure, as a trial, but certainly at the moment there's no role for it at all in blood pressure control. So that's a bit tough, really. So um, we can't stent the renal arteries and we can't zap them with radio frequency. What can we use? So like a charge, a knight on a charger, uh, spironolactone comes over. Um, there's, been a, there's been an understanding probably about 15 years ago that in patients that get referred up to hospitals for the control of their blood pressure. So a niche market, but nevertheless, there's, there's about 10 or 15% of them have an inappropriate high aldosterone activity. They've not, frankly, got cons, they haven't got an adrenal adenoma, but there's just something unusual about their aldosterone axis that promotes aldosterone activity. And there's an understanding that if you treat these people that are resistant hypertension with spironolactone, it will often, not always, but will, can produce uh, beneficial uh, blood pressure lowering. And so this, is, this theory has developed over the last 10 or uh, so years and actually has been incorporated into a number of international guidelines. So both the British ones, NICE, the American JNCA, and these are the... Um, uh, recent European hypertension guidelines that, um, you know, when your backs are against the wall, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone um, can be considered if there's no other contraindications. What might those contraindications be? Well, you shouldn't be using spironolactone if you've got a low EGFR or if you're otherwise got a, a, a high potassium. So clearly you need to keep an eye on creatinine and potassium. But if you've got a reasonable um, uh, creatinine, then spironolactone is certainly something that's third or fourth line that can be considered in resistant hypertension. And one of the pieces of evidence for this, this was a, a, a sub-study out of ASCOT. ASCOT was a big blood pressure trial published, I think, about 10 years ago. And um, it, were, uh, initi well, it was meant to be a, a, a study using perindopril and amlodipine. But in patients that um, still had poorly controlled blood pressure despite those treatments, they added in um, spironolactone. And when they analysed those spironolactone patients, um, patients had 
quite a significant drop in uh, these are resistant blood, um, hypertensives on three or four different medicines and when they added in spironolactone it dropped it from 156 down to 135 so it was pretty pretty effective so certainly spironolactone offers us a possibility to use in cases of resistant hypertension um, so what I would say at this stage is devices might not work, but medications certainly do. They certainly work in studies for well-motivated patients, the type of patient that wants to be in a study that will take their tablets. Medications will work. Um, and we can maybe discuss the ABCD rule later on. Oh, it's a useful rule of thumb. The beta blocker, the B, may have taken a bit of a back seat over the last few years, but, but certainly the... The, um, the fact that the ACE inhibitor and a diuretic synergistic combination is a core um, treatment and if you add a vasodilator to that to, as triple therapy and that vasodilator may be like a calcium channel blocker, philodipine or amlodipine, something like that, or something like doxazosim, that triple therapy of ACE inhibitor or angiotensin blocker, diuretic and vasodilator is a particularly potent and synergistic combination. So what about targets? So we all feel sorry for ourselves um, because there are so many guidelines um, from American, European, Australasian, British, all suggesting different guidelines and different targets. And this was, this was shown, this is a slide from JNC8 uh, guidelines from a, a, a two years ago, um, highlighting all the different targets, all the different guidelines that we're given, often all that uh, argue with each other, really. And so um, if we look, some people suggest 140 over 90, 150 over 90, 140 over 85. Um, so there's a lot of differences between some of the targets that we're being advised to use. In general, in general, 140 over 90 is a reasonable starting place. Um, in older people, these guidelines seem to suggest that we can be a bit more relaxed. Some of the guidelines uh, seem to differ in their diagnosis or in their definition of old. Some people suggest that might be over 60. Some people suggest that might be over 80. I just think you're probably as old as you fit. And, you know, there are 80-year-olds that are more like 60 and vice versa. But there is an understanding that in an older person, we should be lowering blood pressure, but we might be um, a bit less rigorous about how low we go. And then there are some special cases. So maybe diabe uh, diabetics might merit a slightly lower blood pressure, a slightly lower diastolic and certainly people with chronic kidney disease and proteinuria might benefit from a lower uh, blood pressure as well. But as a ballpark, those are not unreasonable. So it was on that, this background of uncertainty about what targets to use um, came the SPRINT trial, which I'm sure you saw that was published towards the end of last year. And I'd just like to spend the last little bit picking through that, if we may. Um, it was a huge trial, about 4,000 patients in both arms, a hypertension trial, probably, um, and um, they were randomised one arm to standard blood pressure lowering and the other arm to really intense blood pressure lowering. The trouble was, well, one trouble was that it was because of its positive early results, it was stopped prematurely. And that's a shame because we know that studies that are stopped prematurely, um, that premature stopping augments any positive results. Anyway, let's look at who was included and excluded from SPRINT. So to be included in the study, you had to have a baseline blood pressure of what between 130 and 180. Hang on a minute. This is a hypertension study, and we're including people with baseline blood pressures of 130. A bit unusual. 
I'd be happy to get 130 for most of my patients at Green Lane, but the other problem is they excluded patients with really bad blood pressure. So if your systolic was 190 or 200, you weren't included. So some of the, um, when we analyze the SPRINT trial, we can't extrapolate some of the findings to really high blood pressure patients. Similarly, they uh, ex only included patients over 50. So again, some of the results can't be extrapolated to young people's blood pressure. What we can say is that they included high patients at high cardiovascular risk. They had to have a minimum on the Framingham data, they had to have a minimum 10-year uh, risk of 15%. So these were really high-risk people, as we'll see. They excluded, however, diabetes, stroke, proteinuria, kidney disease, and heart failure. So that's a lot of our patients. And um, so again, how can we extrapolate some of the findings from this study to that, those, that, those type of patients? So we have to bear that in mind. Um, so they had the two groups, one group were um, titrated to systolics of 140, one group, the other group was titrated to systolics below 120 and the primary outcome was a standard amalgam cardiovascular um, outcome of heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, deaths. The drugs they used were fairly fairly standard. They used the ABCD type of drugs. They used chlorthalidone, a thiazide-like diuretic, thiazide. They used beta blockers, in, especially in patients that had coronary artery disease. That's, that's very reasonable. The, they used the ACE inhibitor lisinopril, very good. They used uh, one I'd never heard of, this angiotensin 2 one, azulsartan, that was given to them by a drug company. Um, but that, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so let's look at some of the demographics of the patients. So they recruited a good age. Uh, so the mean age was 68 in both groups. So they, they were older patients. And about a third of them were greater than 75. So that's very reasonable. What I would like to draw your attention to, though, here, is the fact that a third of patients in both arms had baseline opening blood pressures of below 132. And actually, 60% of patients had baseline blood pressures below 145 systolic, which we might consider pretty good. So these were an unusual set of patients that had pretty good blood pressures to begin with at baseline. However, what they did have was a high... Um, cardiovascular risk. So on average, their 10-year risk was 20%, so pretty reasonable. What, what their body mass index was, they made no comment on this at all during the whole study, but the mean BMI was 30. So you would have thought that one of the uh, uh, management algorithms might have been diet and exercise and lifestyle changes, not mentioned at all. Clearly, drugs are very important. So, but the drugs are very effective. So this is how the blood pressure lowered uh, during the duration of the uh, study. So um, they certainly reached, um, within a year, 136 in the standard treatment group and 121 systolic um, in the intensive arm. So they did very well using uh, uh, just two or three drugs. So the drugs do work. Uh, admittedly, they started from a reasonably low baseline, but they did get to target, or their preset targets. So what were the outcomes? Well, that primary outcome, that amalgam of heart attack, stroke, and deaths, was significantly reduced in the intensive group. Um, so that's the top thing up here, um, by 0.6 of a percent or so which was significant, and it meant the number needed to treat to reduce one of these primary outcomes, you had to treat 180, if you treat 185 people per year with this very low blood pressure, you'll prevent one of those primary outcomes. So you don't get many bangs for your bucks there. Um, 
there were some bizarre things as well. Despite lowering blood pressure very significantly, there was no reduction or extra reduction in heart attack or stroke compared to standard treatment. It's bizarre because we know that lowering blood pressure in, a, in the population will reduce heart attacks and strokes. So why not in this study? In fact, the main driver of lowering the primary outcome, the primary endpoint, was um, episodes of heart failure. We might come back to that, but it was mainly the fact that we were reducing episodes of heart failure by this very low blood pressure that drove the primary outcome. We can't get away from the fact that we did harm, because actually in the uh, intensive care group, um, there was an increased number of reductions in EGFR. So they all suffered a degree of acute kidney injury. What long-term uh, adverse sequelae that has, we don't know yet. But if we carry on looking at the adverse effects, then clearly it's, we can understand that in the intensive arm, there was an increased number of syncope, because you were lowering the blood pressure and people passed out. There was an increased uh, incidence of electrolyte abnormalities of sodiums and potassiums because of all the diuretics and ACE inhibitors that were being used. Um, and as I mentioned, there was an acute, there was an increased incidence of acute kidney injury in the intensive, uh, intensive group. So actually, some of the numbers needed to harm were pretty similar to the number needed to treat. So some of the conclusions of the sprint is, yes, we attained tight blood pressure control on relatively few medications, so the medications do work. Um, it did marginally reduce the primary outcome uh, at the expense of an equal, almost equal number of adverse um, events. But let's look, dig a little bit deeper, shall we? So um, I'm just going to talk about so the patient selection um, and the fact that a lot of the patients that were recruited were normotensive at high cardiovascular risk, but they were normotensive. There was a discrepancy on the ACE inhibitor usage. There was um, equipoise on numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm, which we'll see. And one of the other concerns is, is SPRINT an outlier? Because there was the Accord study a few years ago, 2010, which did exactly the same sort of thing in diabetic patients, i.e. they took a load of diabetic patients, put one in a standard blood pressure arm and one, in, one lot in an intense arm uh, and followed them for years, and there was no difference in outcomes in these diabetics. So the possibilities are that SPRINT is an outlier or that diabetics are a bit strange. So if we look into deep down into the appendix of the SPRINT, sprint trial, uh, there was a, a couple of things that caught my eye. In the standard treatment group, 11% um, of the patients in this hypertension trial weren't on any drugs. It's unusual. There was a discrepancy in the usage of ACE inhibitors, which you can expect, really, because we had to use, they had to use more ACE inhibitors to get the blood pressure down low. But ACE inhibitors were used in 76% of the intense group versus 55%. And if you look at beta blockers, it's very the beta blockers were used in 40% uh, in the intense group and 30% in the standard group. So maybe not surprising that there was a reduction in heart failure outcomes if we were using ACE inhibitors and beta blockers much more in the intense group, because we know ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are good for patients with heart failure. But nevertheless, it struck me that this ACE inhib inhibitor asymmetry was interesting, because this HOPE study, which I'm sure you've heard of from, from a year, few years ago, uh, year 2000, this was a study that took a lot of high-risk people that weren't hypertensive and put half of them on ramipril, an ACE inhibitor, half of them on placebo, and the ACE inhibitor arm did much better with regard to survival than the placebo group. So it's maybe not surprising that if you take a lot of high-risk people and put more of them on an ACE inhibitor, that those people are going to do better, which is essentially what the SPRINT trial found. <laughs> 
And as I mentioned, in the, um, in the appendix of SPRINT, they, they uh, did the numbers needed to harm of all serious adverse events that were either fatal, life-threatening, um, causing disability, needing prolonged hospitalization, and clearly you, uh, in the intense group there was a higher number, and the number needed to harm was 148 for these significant adverse effects, which is less than the numbers needed to treat. So my take-home message from SPRINT was I'm not quite sure whether it's a hypertension study. Clearly they were, they were at high cardiovascular risk. That's a different question. Um, it's certainly a selective study. They were over 50. They had modest blood pressures, if anything. They didn't have significant. They weren't diabetic. They didn't have a stroke. So I'm not sure the generalizability of some of the conclusions that we can draw from SPRINT for some of our patients at the coalface. Um, and so clearly when we look at some of these large studies that are designed to help with population health um, uh, advice, it's difficult sometimes to draw that to the patient in front of you, which needs more of a bespoke case-by-case -case approach. And as well as all that, we're still left with the possibility that SPRINT might be an outlier, because the Cochrane Review did a meta-analysis in 2009, looking at all the studies that had compared um, intense treatment versus standard treatment of blood pressure, and found um, that treating patients any more aggressively than below 140, there wasn't any evidence that it improved morbidity or mortality. So Cochrane, a few years ago, admittedly, weren't terribly impressed that there was um, much to be gained by, much net positive to be gained by um, super low blood pressure control. I was going to leave it there, but in the last week or two, this was published in The Lancet, so I thought I might just mention that in the last couple of minutes. So this was another meta-analysis that acknowledged, they said, yes, of course, we know blood pressure, lowering blood pressure is good for you. So we got that. But what about if we um, analyse that beneficial effect of lowering blood pressure according to the patient's baseline blood pressure? So one of the things they did find, which was reassuring, is that this is reduction in blood pressure on the uh, x-axis and reduction in risk on the y-axis. Uh, and there was a linear relationship. The more you lower blood pressure, the more good you do. And there's no J point. So that was useful. But what they found was if you stratify the beneficial effect of blood pressure by some of the patient demographics, including their baseline blood pressure, so this is the effect of lowering blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, by 10 millimetres of mercury. And to the left of this uh, vertical line is benefit. And if we look at, uh, if we uh, stratify patients according to their blood pressure, uh, uh, baseline blood pressure, if you lower blood pressure by 10 millimetres in group, uh, group with a systolic less than 130, you cause just as much benefit as if their opening blood pressure is greater than 160. So everyone, everyone um, uh, gets some advantage, which is pretty much what we saw um, in um, the SPRINT start trial, that despite them having a relatively low or modest blood pressure at baseline, they benefited by a, an incremental reduction. So I think my take-home messages are, do, do we actually need a target blood pressure? Um, of course we probably do, and 140 over 90 as a ballpark is probably reasonable. But at the moment, we shouldn't be too slavish to that target, and we shouldn't, it shouldn't be too proscriptive. We need to be, react to it. And actually in the future, what might become more important is treating the blood pressure of patients, whatever it is, whatever that blood pressure is, but treating the blood pressure of patients at high baseline cardiovascular risk. Actually, it might be the cardiovascular risk that's the important thing, um, and bringing their blood pressure down from whatever the baseline is. We've also learned that if patients adhere to drugs, the, the drugs work. 
you can bring blood pressure down uh, and there are synergistic combinations but that trying to target a specific um, target blood pressure one size doesn't fit all one target doesn't fit all and we need to um, discuss with patients and produce a bespoke uh, management algorithm that includes tolerability of drugs the overall drug burden of an individual patient, what they want to do. And as I said at the beginning, we need to balance harm versus benefit. So maybe that old definition of blood pressure, the level above which you need, uh, does, the treatment of which does more good than harm, is very important. And I think that's good news for us, actually, because that bespoke management regime, that tailored... Um, management treatment regime for an individual patient can't be done by Dr. Google. It can only be done by us um, in a, a sort of one-to-one -one fashion. So I hope we've all got the next few years of clinical medicine ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. That, um, that's fascinating. It's so helpful to have someone dissect those um, studies for us. Um, and I apologise, um, we've gone over into oh, morning sorry. tea because we started late. Um, but we've got time for just a couple of burning questions. Um, you would need to use the microphones, though, because this session is being recorded. Um, alternatively, Matt's giving a... Um, hypertension update, hy A couple no, of hypertension clinics. Um, oh, clinics. clinics mm. so. Um, any questions? Linda, would, would you want to pop up to the microphone here, Linda? So just a comment, because um, yeah, the sprint study threw a lot of um, curled balls around. Um, the use of the statins in that study, I mean, if it was high cardiovascular risk and low blood pressure, um, their statin use seemed to be really low, I can't remember, 14 or 40%. That was in the sprint, was in it? In the sprint yeah. study. So if you were treating for those people, would we not be more likely to use a statin than the blood pressure lowering in the New Zealand context? Mm. So uh, if you're just talking about cardiovascular risk, absolutely, yeah. But I think that was, that was set out to be a hypertension study, so they weren't quite so concerned with their statin use. Bruce. Can you, just a couple of questions. Um, I just wonder whether that renal injury, renal injury may have related to the ACEs and people with uh, renal artery stenosis and the creatinine popping out, because they didn't describe what the renal injury was, did they? No. Question no. one. I wonder if the other thing, whether the chlorothalidone may have had a, a benefit in the treatment arm by, some of, by the 24 hours cover or um, uh, through various vascular platelet, that sort of stuff, which is what some people think about. Any thoughts on that? Well, certainly, I mean, chlorth well, we know that chlorothalidone is probably the state-of-the-art uh, most effective blood pressure-lowering diuretic. So I think that was reasonable for them to use that, however it mediates uh, its benefit, probably mainly by blood pressure-lowering. But that was very reasonable of them to use it. But you're absolutely right that it, it was the fact that um, in the intense group, the use, the higher use of diuretics and ACE inhibitors that would have caused that acute kidney injury, um, and of course, and we accept a degree of acute kidney injury when you're starting people on ACE inhibitors. It's not unusual for creatinine to go off by maybe 10% or so um, because of that uh, reduction in um, uh, pre-renal flow. Um, but what we don't know is what the adverse effect of that acute kidney injury now has in a few years' time. So, um, so it's certainly something to keep an eye on, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Morning tea.